Jared Diamond, in his well-known book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, describes five factors that contribute to the collapse of civilizations. When a culture is plagued at the same time by climate change, hostile neighbors, loss of essential trading partners, environmental impact, and failures of adaptations to environmental issues, that confluence of chaotic pressures can strain the resilience of the culture to its breaking point and result in catastrophic failure. What was once widely seen as the mysterious collapse of the Mayan civilization has, over the past several decades, been largely explained as the result of all of these influences other than the loss of essential trading partners. In 2016 and 2018, I visited just a very few of the most prominent of the Mayan ruins in the region and thought that I would share some of my videos in the context of findings that support Jared Diamond's summary. Cajal Pech is probably one of the most accessible Mayan sites in Belize. For anyone who is reasonably fit, it's a pleasant walk of about half an hour from any of the hotels that are downtown in San Ignacio which, maybe it's worth mentioning, is in Belize, which is in Central America, nestled in between Mexico and Guatemala. The name Cajal Pech is a modern one, and basically means Shea Ticks, as the blood-sucking arachnids were fairly prevalent during the 1950s when the area was used as cattle pasture. However, these days the place is fairly free of the arachnid parasites. As was very likely the case during the 7th to 9th centuries, when the site was in its heyday as a palace and ceremonial center. The complex is composed of about uh, seven plazas, and probably can be thought of as the equivalent of a modern town hall and main church in a small town. As for most cultures throughout human history, the concept of separation of church and state would have been totally alien to the Maya, and Cajal Pesh would have been the center of political administration, as well as socio-religious ceremonies, including dancing, such as that demonstrated here by my wife after a scrupulous scholarly investigation. Seriously though, I don't think that the moves that she's making based on postures in Mayan glyphs are likely any less accurate than some of the dances I've seen performed at local resorts. As you can see, the area is nicely shaded by tall trees, which was likely not the case during its prime. Stone monuments of the Maya were covered by a thick layer of plaster which can currently only be seen within the interior of some of the restored monuments. The production of plaster, as well as the constant need for cooking fuel, would have denuded the areas surrounding Mayan population centers. The deforestation to support construction, fuel production, and agriculture eventually led to severe environmental impacts. During droughts, mineral concentrations will increase as water evaporates from lakes and reservoirs. Some of those minerals will precipitate out and fall to the bottom. As trees are cleared from an area or perish from lack of water, their pollen will not be blown onto the lake surfaces. So scientists can determine the history of droughts in an area by studying pollen and sediments in the strata of cores sampled from lake bottoms. Scientists can gather similar information by studying caves. Stalactites and stalagmites grow as water seeps through the roof of caves. When rainy seasons are short, these formations will not grow as quickly. Cross sections of stalactites and stalagmites look much like tree rings, with thin rings representing dry years. These shots are from Barton Creek Cave, which is about 27 kilometers or 17 miles from San Ignacio. Finds in such caves illustrate another aspect of Mayan droughts. As droughts became more severe, offerings to water gods became more frequent and more precious. Yes, I said precious, but there was no gold rings or anything else of gold. Routine offerings were predominantly pots. 
As the droughts of the late 8th century became more prolonged, human sacrifices began to appear in the archaeological record. The skull shown in the enlargement here is one such example, but it may have been moved to its prominent position by a modern guide for more dramatic effect, because typically human sacrifices were laid into pools on the floor of caves, which were believed to be entrances into the underworld. There is good evidence that traditional Mayan religions included religious processions past landscape features that were carved into shapes that held spiritual significance. This formation appears to have been modified to enhance its resemblance to a monkey god or monster of the underworld. Processions likely preceded cavern submersion sacrifices. Interments of this type can be found in the Atun Tunichel Muknal cave, usually abbreviated as ATM for obvious reasons, which is about 20 kilometers or 12 miles from San Ignacio. Even though a trip to the ATM was one of the highlights of my trip to Belize. I didn't take any photographs or videos because tourists are no longer allowed to bring cameras into the caves since someone dropped theirs on top of some of the remains. So I swiped these images off the internet. Unfortunately, the religious ceremonies that the Mayans believed had served them for thousands of years, ultimately in the face of the droughts, proved fruitless. Human sacrifices to bloodthirsty gods particularly of babies, may have served as the crudest form of population control. Also destined to ultimate failure were more practical options, such as plastering sinkholes in order to form water reservoirs. These proved to have insufficient capacity to support the large populations in the lowland Maya city-states. However, these and all other measures to manage or control the dense urban populations of the Mayan city-states proved unsustainable in the face of resource crunches precipitated by drought. Estimates indicate that the central Mayan lowlands were depopulated by as much as 80% in the chaotic collapse that occurred around the year 900. Even today, much of the central Mayan lowlands remain relatively unpopulated compared to occupation at the height of the Mayan civilization. The view from the top of the Kana, or Sky Palace, pyramid in Caracol bears witness to this. Caracol lies about 42 kilometers, that's about 26 miles, south of San Ignacio. The name Caracol is a modern one and means snail or spiral in Spanish. That's probably a reference to the winding road leading to the site. Mayan emblem glyphs for the site identify it as Uxhuitza, or Three Hills Water. Kana, or Sky Palace is the principal pyramid at the site. At 41 meters, that's about 136 feet in height, the Kana Pyramid is the tallest in Belize and is the tallest building in Belize to this day. As for other Mayan sites, the layout of the plaza structures results in very interesting acoustics. Uh, Ravi, wave hello. Say, say hi, Robbie. Hi. I can hear you perfectly. A speaker at the top of the pyramid can easily be heard by someone standing in the plaza below. The site may have been settled and occupied from as early as 1200 BC but the bulk of classic Maya construction was during the period from 600 to 900. And that latter date of 900 pretty much coincides with what's generally agreed as the end point of the classic Mayan civilization. There are no monuments with dates on them that are later than the equivalent of 909 AD. Although, of course, the Maya were using their own complex and highly accurate calendar system The Mayan civilization can't be referred to as an empire because there was no central government. The separate city-states were tied together by language and religion, but they were never politically unified. The independent city-states were pretty much continually mounting military action against each other. 
probably much like Florence and Venice did in the late Renaissance in Europe. One of the principal rivals of Oshwitsa Caracol was Tikal. Tikal sits in a Guatemalan site not far, far away, only about 100 kilometers, 60 miles to the north. Even those who are not that familiar with Mayan archaeology have probably seen glimpses of Tikal as the ruins there are fleetingly featured in some of the films and games of the franchise. A glyph commonly associated with accounts of important military actions between city-states was termed the Star Wars glyph in the wake of the popularity of the movie. The Maya recorded dates of military conflicts on carved monuments called stelae, on painted murals, polychrome ceramics, and in book scrolls made of bark. Of these latter, the Spanish conquistadores destroyed most. It was believed that the symbol indicated an association of the date of military conflicts with astronomical events, most often with phases of the planet Venus, which the Maya associated with warfare. In recent years, however, that this glyph represented an astronomical association has come into question. What is in little doubt, however, is that the classic Maya were involved in regular military conflict that involved ritual torture and execution of captured prisoners of war. These events, and others, such as the ascension of new priest kings, were commemorated on stelae and altars were prominently displayed in ceremonial plaza. Offerings were made there and monumental architectural projects were undertaken regularly, particularly in association with milestones of the Mayan calendar. As ceremonial centers grew in size, so did populations. Caracol and Tikal supported populations in the area of 120,000 to 140,000 within 10 kilometers of their cores. Food and fuel demands reduced the resilience of the city-states to resist changes in the environment. Conditions that promoted the expansion of Mayan city-states put them in a more precarious situation once these became less favorable. We've seen that the classic Maya civilization was influenced by four of the five factors that Jared Diamond identifies as common amongst civilizations that lose their cohesion and descend into barbarism, usually with a catastrophic decrease in population. This graph, based on chemical compounds found in sediment cores that reflect levels of rainfall, shows that the driest period in the last 2,000 years occurred between 800 and 1,000 AD. I've overlaid a graph in red of monument building during the same period, which shows monument building increased as drier conditions developed for the first couple of centuries of arid conditions, perhaps reflecting increased military conflicts precipitated by dwindling water and hence food and fuel resources. That period is followed by a sharp drop-off in dated monuments, which might reflect a decrease in population as people moved out of the area and into coastal communities or perished from starvation. This is, of course, a very broad brush, and other folks, more proficient at that kind of thing, have conducted more complex analyses attempting to understand the complex interplay of environmental and socio-political interactions. The indigenous people of the area, of course, never completely disappeared but the educated elite and the skills they possessed certainly seem to have disappeared, to the extent that it's fair to say that in the late 9th century, civilizations of Mesoamerica lost its Mayan. 